All right, good morning, everybody. Sorry for the couple of minutes of delay in starting here. We had another meeting going on within our Zoom account that ran over a little bit late, but I'd like to invite or welcome everybody to our Lower Des Plaines Watershed Group uh, November meeting. Um, we're gonna go through, sorry, things moving forward. So here's just an overview of our agenda. We got kind of really only one business item, which is approving our September 10th uh, meeting minutes that were distributed last week. Um, and then we're gonna move right into our presentation and then I'll come back to uh, some of the updates. Um, don't think we've had any changes in our current members, but what I would like to do would be to get a uh, my participant list up, a show of hands or a raising of hands, I guess, for a motion to approve the meeting minutes from our last meeting. Okay, good. I have Jen and Ed for making the motion. And then I'm gonna get our poll up real quick here. So if you can just uh, click your answer, hit submit, and then we'll move, move things along. All right, thank you very much. So I am going to, let's see. So we have uh, Dustin Gallagher with uh, MWRD and Austin Happel with the um, Shed Aquarium. And I'm gonna let both of them sort of introduce themselves uh, as they get started with their presentation, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Dustin. Uh, he has controls for the presentation. So like I said, I'll let Dustin and, and Austin introduce themselves as part of their presentation. Oh, there we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, is Austin? Yeah, there he is. Um, I'm going to try to share this. Uh, this is kind of a first time for me. So uh, let's hope it works. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is that showing up? Okay. All right, so thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Austin's gonna take over from where I left off, for where I leave off. Um, Austin, you're still, or Dustin, you're not sharing yet. Did you have I'm, to share? I did. So I'm once you pick your screen that you wanna share, then you gotta hit share again. Uh, not asking me. Oh man. Share. I'm sharing this screen. Share. Is there we help? go. Is that yep. working? All right. Yep. There, we there we go. Perfect. All right. So Austin's Austin and I uh, kind of met by chance. We had a meeting uh, probably about two years ago. And it was very interested in Chicago area waterways system. And we have a ton of data and it, we thought it'd be a good idea to partner up and put together a manuscript and talk about the cause uh, fish assemblage. And this is a presentation that sort of summarizes that and a few other things. Uh, I'm gonna start and uh, Austin's going to step in about partway and explain a lot of the uh, methods and some of the discussion of our paper. Um, so let's just get to it. The uh, cause or the Chicago area waterway system historically flowed into the into Lake Michigan. Um, by 1889, the district was created because of health concerns from waterborne illnesses potentially contaminating the uh, water source, AKA Lake Michigan. As you can see in the square here, the water intake cribs and the direction of flow from the Chicago River system and the Calumet River system. The district was tasked with 
reversing the rivers and did so. By 1900, the sanitary ship canal, which is actually right here, I don't know if you guys can see that, uh, was, was completed in 1900. The North Shore Channel was completed in 19, was reversed in 1910. And by 1922, the Calsag Chan, Cal Channel was created and the flow was reversed away from Lake Michigan. And now there are locks and control, and control areas at these three points at Wilmette, at the Chicago Control Works, and in the Calumet River at TJ O'Brien Lock and Dam. So by 1972, the district adopted the TARP, which is the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan. And this slide has a little diagram of uh, the basics of a, the TARP system. Um, it's 109 miles of tunnels that are approximately 150 to 300 feet underground. The main goals of TARP were to protect Lake Michigan, the you know, region's drinking water supply from raw sewage. It's also to improve water quality of local rivers and streams and to provide an outlet for floodwaters to reduce street and basement sewage backup flooding. In this diagram here, we have two examples, one being during dry weather, one during wet weather. During dry weather, flows basically find their way to the sewage treatment plants. And then during wet weather, the water, water, water well, stormwater and wastewater finds its way to the interceptors, which make their way to their deep tunnel and reservoir. And from there, they're pumped to the wastewater treatment plants and treated and then released. Uh, at times, the, if the combination of wastewater and stormwater is too much, then we, what happens is a combined sewer overflow, which is where water would water and wastewater would come out of this pipe into the waterways. So this next slide is kind of a transition of tarp and all its parts. Um, the tarp. Tarp tunnels follow the course of the rivers that they protect and flow into the reservoirs and the water, wastewater treatment plants. Um, sewers are connected via drop shafts at about 273 locations. The uh, tarp, tarp captures wastewater and stormwater therefore decreasing the need for activity at the 370 or so CSO locations, which are shown by the green dots in this, this part of the slide. Um, from there, there's additional storage at three, what, what is now three active reservoirs, the Majewski Reservoir up north, the stage one part of the McCook Reservoir and the Thornton Composite Reservoir the Majewski Reservoir provides 350 million gallons of additional storage. Stage one of McCook provides 3.5 billion gallons of storage and McCook Reservoir itself, the, the uh, I'm sorry, Thornton Composite Reservoir itself provides 4.8 billion gallons of storage. Capturing and treating wastewater and stormwater before it makes its way to the rivers improves water quality and the district has been monitoring the water quality of its service area waterways from early on in its history. Here, this slide gives you a little example of some of the other activities that the, the river is expected to, to provide. Uh, here is the rubber, on the left is the rubber duck races, rubber ducky races. And on the right is when they dye the river for uh, St. Patrick's Day. Despite hosting all these odd events potentially, uh, the river supports a diverse community of fish. Here's a picture. Here's some pictures of some fish that a fisherman can expect or have have caught on the in the cause. Which brings me to our study a little bit. Uh, over on the right here is a map of the study area. We 
focused our efforts on the fish monitoring of the district, which began in 1974 in, in a combination with, with the district's ambient water quality monitoring program. Uh, the program was expanded around 1985 um, and up until 2000, AC electrofishing gear was used and beyond from 2001 and beyond, DC electrofishing gear was used. Uh, sections of the river were sampled about 400 meters per event or per side of river. So like for instance, a sampling event would entail two 400 meter stretches, one on one side of the river, one on the other side of the river where possible. Um, for this study, we, even though we have data from around or over 60 locations, we decided to focus our efforts on nine sites that represent six waterways. Uh, these sites were used because they were most consistently sampled. And we also further reduced the amount of data used to reduce variation by selecting events that occurred between, month, between July and September. Um, from here, uh, Austin's going to take over. So take it away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Dustin. Um, so I, um, Austin Happel, I'm a biologist at the Shedd Aquarium in downtown Chicago, and I um, started um, at Shedd in 2019 and reached out to MWRD knowing that they do a lot of monitoring in the area and have collected a lot of data and was hoping um, to work with them on building some stories. So um, Dustin walked through a lot of the learning that I had to do on how uh, the system's been <laughs> treated and built and studied. Um, and then uh, with that previous slide, trying to help isolate um, some data points that we could use to look at trends over time that aren't really influenced by like the month that they went and sampled or maybe different habitat variables. So that's why we isolated those specific parts out. The next problem became working with the remaining data that we were, um, that I had subset it out. Um, so a couple of things to note is that there's some species that are found throughout the waterway that aren't within um, the subset of data. So we just sort of removed those and ignored them because essentially they're all zeros. Um, all the hybrid sunfish I just grouped into one. Um, there's 11 or so that they've noted um, or at least they've been able to tell, but um, I just grouped them all into one because they're not going to tell us much else anyways. And then the rest boiled down to 58 species that we studied over um, the time period between 1985 and 2018. And I kept these as counts. Um, and then from there, I had sort of two options. We could go with some distance-based sort of analyses. People might be familiar with these as uh, permutational MANOVAs or um, non-metric multidimensional scaling plots, analysis of similarities or um, canonical correspondence analysis, um, all of those are pretty good at exploring data, but they have low power and makes it hard for us to predict um, specific species that are responsible for effects or um, finding actual effect sizes. Um, and yeah, so you lose some of that species specific data. Instead, we went with a modeling approach uh, for an individual um, species. You can build models um, using Poisson or negative binomial or if you have extra information, some zero inflated models. Um, and these can account for mean variance relations, um, but they can also uh, use some new computing power to instead of just modeling one species, we can actually model the whole assemblage changes over time. And that lets you make some predictions um, of what assemblage you might expect to find in different locations or a different year, um, or um, explore the data and seeing which species account for differences between locations or differences between specific years. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, when we're working with just one variable, uh, the model will kind of look like what's colored out there. Uh, we use negative binomial regressions because they work really well with counts, which is what I had the data um, in. Um, it 
helps account for how variable the data can get as we find more species. So not only as you find a larger and larger school of gizzard shad does those numbers tend to also vary quite a bit. Um, and so these negative binomial regressions can help account for that. So building one with just like a single variable, say the count of native species, it would look like that model that's there where um, that I built in R. And we use sample time to help account for sampling effort, even though they mostly sample 400 stretches, one stretch might go really fast um, compared to another one. So if you go to the next, yeah. <clears throat> but if we're working with the whole species assemblage, there's a new function called many GLM that uh, will work in R. And what it does is it essentially fits a regression for each species but then to get whether that gear, year, or waterway is, um, uh, is significant, it actually samples repetitively across all the different species. So it does this sort of bootstrapping procedure to get um, the p-values and um, uh, walled statistic for each of those to tell us which one's significant. And then we can parse back out, is it due to gizzard shad or carp or bluegill or something like that. So let's take a look at what some of the data summary is, which is the next slide. So the most abundant species we found was gizzard shad and then counting down um, are the top, like I think 20 or so um, species. Um, if you look at a couple of those columns, we have the years that they're found in. So uh, sort of occurrence across years, but then also I separated it out based on when they used AC fishing, which was before uh, 2001, and when they used DC electro fishing, which was 2001 and onward, because that electro fishing gear shift can change not only the types of fish that they find, but the sizes and counts. Um, so these are ordered from total down to the bottom. Um, and then you can see the difference between AC and DC there. I have highlighted some native species and we can see on the left side of each of those boxes, the numbers are lower than on the right side. And again, the left side of those boxes are essentially 2000 and earlier and the right side's 2001 and later. So we can already see that there's just larger catches of native fish in later years in the data set. Um, if you click again, it should do invasives. Yeah, so goldfish. And we can see the numbers this time are higher on the left than on the right, meaning we catch fewer invasive species in later years of the data set. And then the final one are some species that like essentially colonize the area in later sets of um, later years of the data set. So we can expect to see mosquito fish, uh, banded killifish, and spot fin shiner abundances um, after 2001 sort of increasing um, and going up. So that's just an initial exploration of um, some of the data. So let's look at some of the actual results. All these results are gonna have a bunch of different colors on them. The colors are those waterways we saw on the map. Um, and on the bottom we'll have year, uh, this time on the y-axis, we have the native species richness for the left plot and on the right plot, the invasive species richness. And you'll also notice a jump in all those lines after 2000 and that's when the gear shift occurred. So we actually um, had a model for the early years and a model for that, the later years to account for that jump. Overall, we can just see that uh, native species richness is sort of increasing almost at an exponential scale, um, whereas invasive species richness pretty much stays the same. Um, there's not a huge difference and the, the mean is generally just um, less than four or so, whereas the native species richness went from less than five to somewhere around 15, which is a, a pretty cool trend and something um, that's exciting to talk about seeing more natives in the area. Now I think the next animation highlights two of the colors. So there's the, the purple line on the top and then the one next to it is an orange line. That's the Calumet River and Little Calumet River. Um, those areas are pretty unique throughout the data set in that they continually show um, higher species richness. And so we'll see that a few times. If we go to the next one. Um, 
So this is uh, just the count of individuals and whether they were native or not. So abundance of native individuals and abundance of invasive individuals. Um, similar trend with the native species and that we see increases in it. Um, this time you'll notice the y-axis is a log change. Um, so anything that's linear is actually kind of a, a curve going either upwards or downwards. Um, but that can be boiled down to we're catching more and more individual um, native fish. Whereas with the invasive fish species, the uh, um, abundance seems to either be holding or going down. It really seemed to depend on uh, what part of the waterway we were looking at. So let's look at some individual fish and some stories we can parse out from there. For all these, the Y axis is going to be catch per unit effort and effort was um, accounted for using um, sampling time um, and uh, standardized to 30 minutes. So if they were um, electrofishing for 30 minutes. And then the means that are plotted are essentially the mean of the waterway by year interaction across um, time. And then all the different dots are all the waterway sampling means. So what each waterway mean was for that year. So for that first left plot, that's Gizzard Chad, we see a um, sort of an exponential increase in the first part of the data set and then sort of a leveling off where the abundance doesn't really change in the second part. Uh, blunt nose minnow, we see a lot more of them in the Calumet River, um, in the Sanitary Ship Canal, um, generally sort of staying the same, not as drastic increases um, as we see saw with gizzard shad there. In Golden Shiner, uh, we see more of those in the Calsac Channel and the Little Calumet River. Um, in later years of the data set, some more in the Sanitary Ship Canal. All three of these are sort of the base of a, uh, the prey base for um, this area. So seeing either steady level populations or increasing populations of these prey species speak to how the food web um, is sort of functioning and how we're offering prey. Uh, so hopefully we can start seeing more predators come um, to the system to eat those prey. So what's the next one? Um, the most common uh, invasive fish in the area is the common carp. So we were interested in looking at their abundance and how that changed. Um, essentially for the first part of the uh, data set, not much of a huge shift in um, catches, but in the second part, there was a slightly negative trend and that's mostly due to the Lockport um, Lock and Dam site. It seems like at that site, um, abundance of common carp really dropped off after 2006. Um, and this is somewhat interesting because they're seeing declines in common carp throughout large chunks of the Mississippi River Basin. Um, so it's interesting that we're seeing it at the Lockport Lock and Dam, but not the other sections of uh, the waterways. And so that might be something worth exploring um, in the future. Um, converse to that, we have the exponential increases in the banded killifish. This was something that was noted a few years ago by Phil Willink and some members of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, for us, they showed up in our subset of data um, in 2012 and then sort of really took off after 2015. Um, and then yellow bullhead really showed up when they switched gears. So they switched those electrofishing gears in 2001, and that seems to be when they really started catching yellow bullhead. Um, I would expect that some of them were there before 2001. Um, they see little blips of where they catch some of them, but um, it seems like that gear shift really affected the catch of catfish there. Um, and so the next one are some of the centrarchids and some of the things people really love fishing for. So of course we wanted to talk about those. <laughs> the catches of all of them are increasing, which is great to see. Um, and was something we were hoping to see after we were looking at some of those prey fish. Um, so here we're seeing bluegill, green sunfish and pumpkin seed all sort of increasing throughout the data set, especially in later years. There's a sort of exponential increase from 2000 until the end of the data set. Um, especially in all of those three plots, the later three years that are sampled, none of the sampling sets have zeros, which is really cool. And then largemouth bass really seem to increase um, in the first chunk of data, say in the late 90s, and then sort of leveled off um, 
from there. And we tend to see more of the largemouth bass in the Little Calumet River and at the Calumet River site. Um, and some of the other ones, you'll see a lot of uh, purple at the top and a lot of orange squares at the top of theirs uh, being those two sites again. We'll go to the next one, which highlights a way that we can actually use that many GLM uh, function in R. What we were able to do is isolate the species that had differences in location. So which species abundances were different um, across different parts of the waterway? Um, and this is just for 2001 to 2018. Um, and just the species that had significant differences between um, sampling locations. And the main thing that I want to, to point out is that you'll see a lot of orange and purple being high um, in this graph. And that orange and purple corresponds again to that Calumet River and Little Calumet um, River locations um, in the data set. And you'll see a few yellows being a sanitary ship canal, but overall higher abundances of these species over in those Calumet area um, sites. So those are all the results. Um, it's a lot to go through, um, but pretty fun to boil down and then talk to people about. Um, one thing we noted is that there's little change in species that are considered pollution sensitive. Um, and I generally think of these pollution sensitive um, demarcations as rather hand wavy uh, because it really depends on how they um, assess whether it was sensitive or not. Um, often they'll subject them to one sort of stressor in isolation, whereas here we have a confluence of stressors. So um, I'm not super surprised that we don't see changes in um, species denoted as sensitive. So instead, I like to just talk about how species richness and general diversity increased, and especially among native um, fish to the area. If we see larger and larger numbers and types of um, species in the area, that must mean that we have reduced the stressors within the waterway um, if we're allowing these um, various species to come back. Um, and it must be amenable to all their various um, needs. So then we'll go to the next one, which points out um, where the Calumet River site is. It's actually on the outside of uh, the TJ O'Brien Lock and Dam. So all those orange squares that I was pointing out in all the graphs before are actually from a location that is outside the Lock and Dam and adjacent to Lake Calumet. So that means it gets water from the Calumet River that flows in from Lake Michigan, but it also has water and habitat variables within uh, Lake Calumet. So it's not super surprising that this area has higher uh, fish diversity because there's such a diverse habitat area over there. Um, fish can go into Lake Calumet and go up in those boat slips. There's a bunch of parks over there that maybe have downed woody debris nearby. And then there's clean water coming in through the um, Calumet River uh, from Lake Michigan. Um, and so uh, it's not super surprising that there's high fish diversity there, but it's nice to note it. And then just a little further south um, along the river, or I guess a little west is the little Calumet um, sampling site, which is also near um, an, an inflowing river that has flown through a bunch of um, forest preserves. So that's like the second most diverse site that we saw. <coughs> So moving forward, uh, these are working waterways. So any sort of um, habitat enhancements that we try to do have to be pretty creative. Um, I like to refer to them as enhancements rather than um, say restoration efforts because you can't restore something that didn't exist a hundred years ago. Um, so instead we can move towards enhancing these waterways. And one way to do it is to get creative with habitat enhancements. Um, species respond more to just water quality. We're noting higher species diversity in areas with higher habitat diversity. So let's maybe try to add more habitat to some of these habitat poor areas. And Chicago's Wild Mile Project is one way of doing that. Um, this is a project run by a nonprofit called Urban Rivers. Um, Shed has partnered with them to help build out these floating wetlands. Uh, floating wetlands started in uh, wastewater treatment plants um, and their ponds in order to help suck up the nutrients and pollutants in those ponds. 
Um, and so these guys have been actually using them to add sort of um, beauty to the Chicago River, but also add habitat to the waterway that not only fish can use with the roots underneath the plants, but um, birds, amphibians, and turtles can use with all the plants growing on top. The plants they're using are native wetland plants, so they should survive um, throughout the winter and they should help pollinators within the area. So this is a project that I encourage people to keep an eye on um, and see how it grows and functions. Um, this year they put a dock in, so you can actually go and walk down to these floating wetlands and see them up close and uh, come in contact with the river. Um, and we're hoping to start talking to people and change their perceptions of um, the river. So all of this, uh, if you go to the next, slide. Yeah, so this um, data was published in a paper um, in a journal called Urban Ecosystems. Um, so the title of it, Chicago's Fish Assemblage Over 30 Years. Um, and then I kind of put in there that we're seeing more fish and more native species. Um, and Dustin and I are co-authors on it. Uh, and that's just sort of our first step at taking stabs into all the monitoring data that's collected within the region. Um, MWRD has quite a bit more fish um, data. Uh, we just use counts, but they also have lengths and weights that we'd like to start looking at. They have a ton of water quality data that we can maybe hopefully start poking at and relating to fish diversity and length and growth. Um, and in general, um, starting to move towards understanding how this almost wholly built environment functions as an ecosystem so we can start promoting um, it as a healthy ecosystem and help promote it as a fishing resource for the community. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide as we're uh, moving towards that fishing resource um, and recapping all that data analysis, we'll uh, leave it here and hopefully we can have discussions with people as they come up with questions. So um, thanks for inviting us to talk and uh, I look forward to um, discussing things with people. Thank you, Austin and Dustin. So I have the Q&A box and chat box open. Um, if anybody has any questions for um, either Austin or Dustin, if you wanna throw them up there and I can, can relate them. Uh, one of the things, um, so Dustin and Austin had done this presentation over the summer for DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group, um, which I really enjoyed. And one of the reasons why I asked them to come and do it here is because it actually has even more relevance for the lower Des Plaines as all of these waterways that uh, they were talking about today come into the Des Plaines. Um, so although the, the cause area, land area, um, isn't a part of our sort of watershed boundary. Um, all the things that happen over there definitely uh, impact the displays uh, for better or for worse. Uh, so that's where I was, you know, really kind of excited to see the, the presentation. And you know, obviously they have a lot of data. MWRDs have been collecting data both in these waterways as, as well as on the displays for a long time. And so to be able to kind of look at the things that they've done, and then as we continue to build our um, and a data set here in the displays and the tributaries. Uh, I'd definitely like to spend some time some somewhere down the road uh, with Austin, kind of looking at the, the work that we're getting started on uh, with this sort of first round of sampling um, and how, you know, maybe it ties into, you know, sort of that bigger picture um, and being able to, to relate changes. The other part that I thought was really um, exciting and maybe we'll, you know, look to, to get some another presentation more specifically on is some of the things that, that's going on in that uh, on the Chicago Wild Mile, uh, which I've, I've seen uh, some other presentations on as well. Um, one of the challenges we still have uh, in many of these areas is, is we still do have ships coming through these sections where the Chicago Mile or that Wild Mile section is an area that no longer has shipping on it, if I remember that correctly. Um, so right. You know, there's definitely challenges when you have large barges coming by, yeah, uh, but I, issue. I don't, those poor urban rivers guys had to do a lot of fighting to find um, an area that would work. Um, yeah, for that. but you're, yeah. you're right. They're doing it currently in an off, mm -hmm. off navigationable <laughs> section. Yeah. But I mean, one of the areas that I think 
could be really interesting with some of that stuff are portions of the INM canal. I mean, there are portions that have just sort of filled in and really function more like wetlands anyway. Um, but I think there could be a number of opportunities uh, for improving um, habitat within the, the INM canal, because uh, that, again, is also coming into the displains and, um, and figuring out some connections, because we definitely have a number of tributaries that once came all the way to the displains, but now are interrupted by the INM canal. So I think there's all kinds of things um, kind of in that area that I think would be interesting to, to pursue down the road. Uh, so I do have a question here. What about the Asian carp species? What about the Asian carp species change? Um, not exactly sure, Tim. Are you asking, Tim, are you asking about the um, movement of Asian carp up into the system? Population change. So the change, oh, so why are you, why do you think there is a decrease in common carp, I guess? And you kind of showed it locally, uh, well, but also sort of overall Mississippi Basin. Yeah, so I guess with within the cause, the only Asian carp that they found within the data set was like one grass carp. Um, and those don't seem to be making it up past um, the Dresden Lock and Dam, I believe. Um, as far as common carp and their population change, the current sort of theory seems to be that there is um, a virus that knocks out some of the juveniles. Um, there's only been one or two sort of papers poking at it out of the Havana, Illinois River um, biostation. And th their general assumption was that it ended up being due to some sort of virus because there wasn't a huge drop after Asian carp appeared. It was more kind of a continual decline in um, smaller sized individuals. So they just keep seeing larger and larger common carp and fewer and fewer of those larger and larger ones. Um, and that's their current theory. I'd love to start poking at it more uh, because I find it super interesting, but um, there's only yeah. so much time. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I got a question maybe more for Dustin. Is, are there any relations to species or habitat data um, as related to the MWRD, the, the aeration stations that you guys have? Like, do you guys have, and I know that may be outside of this data set. Yeah. Um, well, we, we do, we do uh, have some uh, collection data around our aeration stations. Like for instance, we, we try to like during a regular field season, we try to uh, sample around, was it three out of the five SEPA stations? Uh, so we have some long, I wouldn't say terribly long-term data, but we do have data from those collections that we just, we have on hand. We haven't really dug in very deep, but we do, it is available. I'd say that's something too that I'm sort of interested in looking at is can we dive further into this large data set and see like, okay, the SEPA stations came online in 94, 95. What, when do we see a shift in species or do we see a shift in species or size of individuals? And the same as um, a lot of the tarp tunnels came online in 2006. Do we start seeing a shift in um, either abundance or types of species or um, the size of individuals or things. Yeah, can you, can, you, can you see that in the data? Can it be sussed out? Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Do, does it show any relation to those sort of policy shifts? And that's something that we're hoping to sort of move towards. And this was just the initial like, hey, things look good <laughs> across all this time. Yeah. Now that's let's kind of start parsing apart other little stories and things. So. Yeah, and I mean, obviously there's been, oh, whole lot of shift in the in people's use of these waterways, you know, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, you know, even the picture there that you had of people jumping into into the river, uh, you know, there are a lot more people recreating uh, within the Chicago area waterways. Um, so yeah, it's kind of always interesting to, to be able to tie that data back um, and see, you know, what, it, what kind of changes Obviously, if we're seeing more fish and, and more bugs in the water, you know, we, we've got to be heading in the right right direction. 
<laughs> yeah, that's the basic assumption I keep <laughs> leading on. If you're having more and more um, mouths that we know are picky about not only their environment and what they eat, things must be doing better and better. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think that is it we have for questions. Um, I will definitely include, well, both of your email addresses are in the presentations there if people have questions. Um, I mean, Dustin is a, a regular participant in our meetings for Lower Dust Plains. Uh, so, you know, we always have kind of a direct direct line uh, to MWRD with, with questions related back to that. And uh, I would definitely like to thank you guys both for uh, the presentation. And like I said, Austin, uh, between you and, and maybe some folks at, at Urban Rivers, uh, you know, maybe look at getting another presentation more specifically about what they did. Um, Cause I think those floating wetlands are, are really cool. Uh, we've seen them used in a couple of different places. I've seen them in other cities. Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting concept. Cause like you said, not only the fish kind of having that habitat of the roots coming down into the water, but places I've seen them, you got you know, the ducks are nesting on them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just providing that little extra piece of, of habitat that that wasn't there. And I think anywhere uh, kind of across the landscape, wherever we're doing restoration or creation, it truly is, if you build it, they will come. Um, and so that's, that's always exciting. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for that. And we're gonna jump back into the rest of our meeting here. I'm gonna switch screens around. All right, um, so we had just a couple of updates left uh, for getting into winter. Uh, we and I have been working on our outreach materials uh, for winter. So just like all the other uh, seasons, uh, you can get to those through our website, through members and then the seasonal campaigns and click on winter. Um, some of the new stuff we have this year, we have a, num a number of new blog posts. Uh, Kind of really focusing on the anti-icing and the, you know, kind of letting residents know what those stripes are out on the road, uh, especially as more and more communities are using anti-icing. Uh, you know, we're hoping that these materials are helpful uh, to, to get out to your residents. Really kind of talking about how um, salt works, uh, kind of getting into a little bit of the science. Um, and then we've been trying to add sort of an ecology piece uh, each season. And so kind of talking about what, what fish do in the winter um, and how uh, kind of tying back to restoration efforts and both the creation and, and main, maintaining good habitat in our streams and how that's really helpful uh, to fish and, and uh, other critters during the winter. So both of those are available uh, to download from, from the website, or all three of those, excuse me. Um, let's see, we have, oh, I guess I have those actually listed. We're, so we have a number of blog posts to go with the blog articles, and then we have the social media posts to go with those articles. Uh, so there's a kind of a variety of them that you can choose from um, to then be able to kind of link back to the blog post. Uh, we have a PSA video that we were able to uh, work with a community up in Minnesota that did a really nice piece about uh, more is not always better, kind of getting the idea that more salt is not always better. And, uh, they were very gracious when we contacted them and actually gave us all of their, their whole PSA video and um, kind of took off their part at the end. And so we're, we uh, worked with some partners, got a nice aerial river shot, and uh, we're just putting in some of our local information at the end of it. And then that will be available uh, on the website soon. Uh, so we're excited about that one. Leah has been, uh, she worked on a new poster this year. Um, that is available as a, a PDF on the website. Um, something you can put on your website, uh, print it up, put it up in your village hall, although not many people are visiting village halls these days or anywhere, uh, but something definitely that can be shared electronically. And then some of the other pieces that are, you know, from uh, some of the work we've done in the past with the bookmark, uh, both as physically, I can get you the bookmarks, um, and then we have them as graphics. So if you just wanted to use the graphic, Leah kind of reoriented the back a little bit so that the, 
that backside kind of fits a little bit better as a graphic on, on a website. And then all the stuff from last year and previous years are still up there. So you know, some of the examples of, of the blog posts um, and social media pieces that we have from last year. Uh, stuff is all just as relevant now as it was last year. Uh, but you know, just a reminder that, that these materials are still there as well as the, um, the FAQ sheet that we put together. So we have this in a couple of formats. We have it in like a PDF and this format is fairly general. It should apply to just about any uh, community across our region, but we also have it in a word format so that if there are specific uh, pieces of information that you wanna add to your community, uh, you know, maybe in uh, your ordinance or code uh, that might be specific to one of these topics, uh, that you know, this is at least a, a nice starting point for you, and you can customize it uh, for your community. Um, this is something that you know I think is really useful to have on hand. I mean, a available on your website uh, to help answer some of those questions for folks, uh, as well as uh, for whoever it is that's answering the phones when people are calling and maybe complaining about things during a storm. That you know, at least you have some of these answers that are right there available for them. Uh, we also have these in a um, kind of a pull-down format in onsaltsmart.org. There's a, a page that have these sort of embedded into it. So it's another example of a way that, um, you know, you could Im implement those, that into your own website or sort of kind of having the list of all of the questions and you can just click on the one question and it opens up and you can read the answer. Um, so a couple of different ways uh, that this could be kind of incorporated in, into your website. Uh, and made available. So again, this is available at the on that same page within the website. Just scroll down a little bit farther. Um, and I think we we said this last time. Um, you know, we still have a whole bunch of cups and bookmarks. We are happy to get those out to folks. Um, you know, we're out across the watershed doing various things, um, and we have staff here at the foundation that kind of live all over the place. So we've been able to 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 distribute these, uh, but if you are interested in getting some or getting more of them, uh, please just let us know and we will work on getting those out to you. So just drop me an email, drop Leah an email. Um, either way, we can get these things out to you. Um, we always like to remind people that we have our Facebook page and Leah is uh, really good. She kind of just schedules out different posts as well as putting um, posts up sort of trying to do things in a timely manner as well. So we have some stuff that's just sort of standard uh, information that could go out um, without necessarily a specific time, like uh, like this one just kind of about dragonflies and what they do in the winter. Um, but then the next one, uh, you know, Leah posted this up uh, the other day before the rain, uh, kind of the idea is what we've been talking about for from our fall campaign about trying to get leaves up off of uh, the streets prior to a rain. And so uh, we're trying to model how these things can be used. So whether uh, you your community follows this page um, or you know you want to check in here periodically, say how we, we are using some of these posts uh, just to kind of help you see how they fit in. And so any questions, we're happy to customize materials, um, you know, as far as we can add logos to things for individual communities. If there are topics uh, that you know you guys could really use some help on getting some messaging out, we're happy to help out with that. Uh, customize some of those messages. So uh, you know, always feel free to, to reach out to Leah uh, specifically. You can also reach out to me. I can get stuff over to Leah. Uh, but we're always looking for input. Um, so we we try to work kind of a season ahead. Uh, so that's what, you know, we pretty much got all of the winter stuff wrapped up right now, although winter is a really long season. Um, so there probably will be some additional pieces uh, through the winter that we may add uh, just because, you know, maybe we're able to get some, some better pictures now at this time of year, um, or we get some input from folks about things that they would like to need. We definitely would share those uh, broad, more broadly. Um, but right now we're actually delving into spring and summer. Uh, so, you know, kind of thinking ahead, if there are uh, topic areas uh, that, that are of interest to folks, uh, let us know. So we had a really good 
uh, winter de-icing workshop season um, better than expected. Uh, we were a little worried this year with, with moving to the virtual um, world of doing a four hour long uh, training would bring um, many more challenges than it did. We actually got a very good response. So we switched things up quite a bit um, in that normally we would have a workshop. So within, from the perspective of the Conservation Foundation, we provide staffing to Lower DuPage, Lower Des Plaines, uh, the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group. And we also do um, work on this topic with King County. So amongst staff that work with those watershed groups um, and staff that work with King County, we would coordinate workshops in Will County, in DuPage County, and in King County. So we have different locations. So we were usually running at least five workshops, in-person workshops in the past. Um, this year with them being virtual, we chose to do two roads workshops, basically same workshop, just different days, and one parking lots and sidewalks, and we split the cost among the four organizations. Um, we made our registration fee really very low in that an organization really only needed to register once uh, for a particular workshop if they wanted to attend two workshops and you know registration for each one, but then they could share that link with all of their staff. Um, so, you know, we weren't quite sure how that was all gonna work out from a financial standpoint. It ended up working out very well. Um, and we covered all of our costs to uh, put the workshop on, which basically was just paying uh, Fortin Consulting. Um, but we were able to cover all those costs. And I think we might've even made a little bit of money in the end across all four groups, which is um, a positive, positive outcome. Um, you know, we're not meant to make money, but we always do want to try to cover our costs and we were able to do that. But we were also able to get, uh, I think a lot more people trained. Um, we had over five, well, so getting the numbers was a little more challenging because it wasn't by the number of people that we registered. We did do some polling, uh, trying to ask folks, you know, how many people are in the room with you? Because some communities, you know, put, put it up in their uh, village hall board room um, and had staff, you know, in there and spread out. And so we were trying to, you know, we polled how many people were in the room. So I think we had well over 500 um, people participate in the roads and I believe the parking lots and sidewalks one, I don't have that number in front of me, but we were somewhere between 175 and 200. Um, so I think we had really good turnout um, and I think got probably more people trained in a community than we would have in the past, just because I think between the cost and, and uh, the ease of kind of having people there and or doing it from home. Um, the other thing that we did add this year uh, were these winter technical briefs. So we were looking at, we had some topics where we would normally potentially have another or, or a group of speakers, uh, depending on how we did the various workshops, um, where we'd bring, bring in different experts talking about uh, topics. And since we didn't really have the ability to do that this year in person, uh, we've been doing these winter technical briefs. Um, so they're kind of mini webinar series. The idea is that they're, you know, half hour or less on a very specific topic. They're free. These are recorded. We couldn't record the main trainings because those are kind of a proprietary training for Horton Consulting, so we couldn't record those. But all of these have been recorded. Uh, we have one left next Tuesday um, on brine making. They've been free. We will have the videos for all of these up soon uh, on the website. That was kind of the other part too, of being able to continue to expand some content. Um, so we have, uh, we, we did one on um, kind of looking at organics. So things like um, beet juice or other carbohydrates or other uh, blends for your liquid application. Uh, so that was the first one um, with Denver Preston from KTEC. We had one on uh, source well and cooperative purchasing. Um, so again, this is a very kind of narrow audience, but I think a, a very worthwhile presentation um, and definitely something you can go back and look at if your community doesn't participate in the cooperative purchasing. Um, we had some really good information presented on that. Uh, we just did one on Tuesday on the benefits of segmented blades. Uh, Scott Weber has been in 
super active in the uh, DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group uh, Chloride Committee, uh, has done a number of presentations uh, with Steve McCracken for other municipalities, other tree groups. Uh, he's got you know nearly 30 years of experience uh, in, in the public works sector at Hanover Park and definitely a leader uh, in this topic. And they did some internal research in looking at segmented blades. Uh, and so not only from a kind of cost perspective, uh, you know, definitely in tenant seeing a pretty good return on their investment as compared to uh, the kind of straight steel blade or single piece steel blade, uh, but also a great improvement in conditions for the driver with reduced vibration, reduced noise. Um, so that one there, and that one we actually went out um, and videotaped it. Uh, and then we presented that at, and then did a question and answer after that. And then like I said, we have the last one on Tuesday. Uh, so registration's available at saltsmart.org. They're free, you just gotta register ahead of time. Um, and like I said, we'll have all of these up on the website. And then the one last piece that we'll have is um, we worked with some of the staff from Fox Valley Park District to do a calibration video for calibrating walk behind salt spreaders. And so we're kind of in the editing phase of that right now, and that'll be another resource that we'll have available out there for um, for staff. That'll be should be a relatively short, like eight or so minute video uh, about the steps of doing that type of calibration. It's something I mean I've looked all over the web and have not been able to find a video for that. And so it's something we've been talking about for a while, and we finally were able to to go out and get the, the footage done, and we should have that available soon. I think the last piece for our outreach side of things is um, over the summer, Conservation Foundation received a grant from Illinois American Water, part of their uh, environmental grant program um, to do a pet waste campaign. And with COVID, some of the plans we have for it didn't quite all come together, but uh, but we, we made some adjustments, but this is so sort of where we ended up is that we're gonna have uh, these signs were getting printed, so there'll be aluminum signs, about 12 by 18 in size, uh, that kind of gets at, you know, just more messaging around picking up dog poop. Uh, we're going to have dispensers available, uh, so we'll have the dispenser and the sign, as well as some bags uh, to get you started with, and we're looking for, for partners. I'm going to be sending this out to all of our communities and park districts within our watershed areas. It'll be kind of a first come, first serve we're going to have about 100 signs and I think within the grant we're able to purchase 42 or 45 of the dispensers. Um, basically what we're looking for uh, from a partner standpoint, we originally were, were going to do sort of a cost share, but uh, with, with COVID and understanding um, sort of the issues around coming up with some funding, we knew that would be challenging. So we want to remove those barriers. So really all we're looking for is that you provide a post um, and install them, send us a picture, and then participate in our social media campaign. So we've um, got a couple of the posts there. Leah's working on some additional posts and messaging, and we're going to do like a four-week uh, campaign coming up here um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so we'll be able to kind of pull people in on that. So I'm going to be sending some stuff out. If this is something that you know for sure your community is interested in, drop me an email and we will get you on the list. Um, but again, this sort of just fits in with our looking at nutrients from all different sources. Uh, you know, definitely the water quality component um, involved here, but also just the growth factor, which makes it a little bit easier to, to talk with people about. Um, so this is you know, just another, another piece that we've been working on. Um, I think at the last meeting, we had kind of given an update on our sampling, all of our sampling. I think the only thing we had left at that point was collecting uh, sediment samples um, at all of our uh, sites in Hickory Creek and uh, the sites we were redoing on the displays. All that sampling has been done. We're just waiting for some of the last bits of chemistry data to come in. Um, so we had a, a very, I would say, successful sampling year. We were able to get everything done that we had intended on getting done. Um, and then uh, over the winter, we'll be getting prepped for uh, the last round or the last piece of sampling. So we had split up our sampling over four years. Um, so we'll get to the last of the tributary sites. So the you know, we've done Hickory Creek and we did Willow and Crystal 
uh, creeks up around O'Hare. Um, and so next year we'll get all the remaining trips um, and that will finish off our first round of sampling. Um, and I think that's, that's really about it. There's really been no movement on the chloride variant stuff at this point. Uh, so we're still sort of in a holding pattern to hear about how that stuff is gonna uh, kind of shake out in the end. Um, unless we have any other questions, I think we've gotten through our agenda. Let's see, Which I don't see any questions out there. All right. I am going to go ahead and close things out. I want to thank everybody again for uh, attending today. We'll get the, the presentation up on the website uh, video of the, of the whole meeting here. And if you have questions um, about any of the stuff that was presented today, uh, go ahead and send me an email and pass those on to either our presenters or uh, so if you have things directly for Leah, go ahead and reach, reach out to Leah. If you want cups or bookmarks, let us know if you have any ideas about outreach um, topics, particularly as we're starting to think about spring and summer. Uh, we'd love to hear those from you. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and close things out. Thank you again and have a safe and happy holiday. And our next meeting will be um, in January for our annual meeting. We'll have more information uh, coming out about that soon. So thank you again to our presenters, to Austin and Dustin, and uh, we'll close things out. Thank you. <laughs>